As said before, Kamen Rider is a long show and it changes extensively over the course of its run. The first wave of those changes coincides with the departure of its original protagonist, Takashi Hongo. To explain away a real life filmmaking accident, the narrative sends Takashi overseas to battle the forces of Shocker. But fear not, the good people of Japan were not abandoned. You see, before his exit, Takeshi discovered and rescued another victim of Shocker's Rider Cyborg series, photographer Hayato Ichimonji. So, while Takashi handles his business abroad, Hayato shoulders the responsibility of protecting Japan from Shocker. But how does Hayato compare to his predecessor? Quite well, actually. Put aside your apprehensions, because Hayato, played by Takashi Sasaki, instantly removes all doubts about whether or not he'll be a worthy successor. As a writer, he is still very much an agent of justice, waging war against the forces of evil. But he isn't a mere retread of Takashi. And while there was more to Takashi than doom and gloom, he was defined in large part by an inability to come to terms with his cyborg nature, something which acted as a barrier between him and others. That he often fought a one-man war against a virtually omnipotent foe visibly weighed on him as well. Hayato, on the other hand, has a more confident, outgoing disposition, happier, and greater ease about dealing with those around him. He seems far less affected by his newfound reality and the war he continues in his predecessor's place. On top of all of this, he's based and he knows it. All of which is fine. Everyone processes situations differently. And putting aside the external reasons for the change in lead characters, it's cool to see a different reaction to the same life-changing ordeal. That is, being turned into a cyborg by an evil organization and devoting your life to fighting against that organization. A filmmaking misfortune ended up adding a legitimately neat wrinkle to the series. Hayato spends a long time leading the show, and it is during his tenure as Kamen Rider that a number of important elements are introduced or become firmly rooted. That famous Henshin transformation sequence? It's not a thing until Hayato's debut episode. And this is it, the very first Henshin. Before this, Takashi's transformations were normally quick transitions on his motorcycle or whatever caused the turnbine of his belt to spin, such as falling. Upon his return, Takashi would receive a transformation sequence of his own. The Hayato-led phase of the show is also where Kamen Rider's role as the idol of children is properly established. Children have long since become the dominant demographic of tokusatsu, so to further embrace this side of the character was a natural choice to make. At the height of the show's popularity, it was probably hard to find a kid who didn't want to be Kamen Rider, and for a small price, that wish could come true. But on to the other characters. Of the original cast, only Tobei Tachibana and FBI agent Taki Kazuya, the latter introduced late in the previous arc, are carried over into this part of the show, at least in any meaningful way that is. Ruriko Midorikawa is said to have traveled overseas with Takashi, but this is the end of the road for her character. And although they eventually disappear without fanfare or comment, Shiro sticks around for a couple episodes more, and Hiromi survives about another 12. As for the remaining characters, Tachibana is gradually relegated to the sidelines as a mentor, his age used for comedic effect, contrasted with the surrounding youthful faces. <laughs> Still, he remains likable and relevant. Meanwhile, Taki basically becomes co-lead, which isn't a bad shakeup at all. Tachibana gelled better with the previous protagonist, plus his capacity for fighting was limited. So, in regards to the latter point, giving Ryder a companion he can believably fight beside and trust to hold their own is a logical choice for the action-heavy show. On top of that, there is great synergy between Taki and Hayato. Whether together or apart, this duo uncovering and foiling the latest shocker plot often makes for entertaining and occasionally touching television. It can also be considered a forerunner to the double writer action to come, but more on that later. Beyond the change in leads and the returning characters, a host of new characters are introduced. There's also this kid, Goro. For whatever reason, he's not acknowledged here, but he's as important as the others and has quite the mouth on him. 
Not much to them, though they're a livelier bunch who do the humorous parts well and the dynamics they bring are a whole lot more fun. The glue which holds all of this together is the motorcycle club at Tachibana Auto Center, a replacement for Snack Amigo. Shocker is afforded upgrades as well, for example the outfits of the henchmen, out with the face paint and barrette, in with the natural libre mask, an inch closer to the outfits they're best remembered for today. But the biggest change to the Shocker ranks is the arrival of one of the more blatant connections to wartime Germany yet, Colonel Zoll. Infamous for his successful exploits in the Middle East, the colonel is dispatched to Japan to deal with the common Rider problem. You see, Ryder has put a serious dent into the plans and reputation of the Shocker Japanese branch, so now Colonel Zoll has come to put things back on track, and a better time couldn't have been picked. The Japanese Shocker branch had fallen to causing traffic accidents by this point. A painful low. Minus a few goofy schemes, things get nasty under Colonel Zoll's watchful eye. Shocker employees are doubles down on biological warfare, chemical warfare, and brainwashing youth to use as child soldiers. But this ruthlessness isn't just left to subordinates. He is not only not afraid to get his hands dirty, he seems to revel in it and can hold his own in a fight. In his very first episode, he dons a disguise to frame Taki for murder. Put simply, the guy is plain evil and he loves it. However, his reign of terror was not to last. After a many a struggle, Colonel Zoll is forced into revealing his true form and staking everything on the fist fight with Kamen Rider. He initially has the upper hand, nevertheless, Kamen Rider eventually turns the tables and the vile Zoll is vanquished. This leaves us at episode 39, a fine stopping point for now. But before we wrap things up, here's a few shout outs to Tokusatsu veterans and other business. First, there's Anu Mari of Branded to Kill fame, a 1967 Yakuza art film wherein she plays a femme fatale. In Kamen Rider, she's a handler for one of the Shocker cyborgs in a two-parter, and I'm convinced her character's death in a boxing arena was meant to recall her character's fate in Branded to Kill. This might also be a fun nod to brand it to kill. Anyway, this wasn't her first brush with Tokusatsu. Previously, she guest starred in an episode of the original Ultraman series and an episode of Ultra 7. Next, there's Chiyoko Ishii. She plays one of the kidnapped children in episode 27. Her other tokusatsu experience includes a sizable role in episode 29 of Return of Ultraman and at least one episode of Love Love, Witch Teacher. And with all of this talk of Ultraman, here's another neat overlap between the two franchises. Return of Ultraman and Kamen Rider, which were airing at the same time, cover essentially the same subject matter in episodes released a mere month apart. In both, the respective hero suffers a massive defeat, which deals a serious blow to the main child character who looks up to them. Then the disillusioned hero receives a stern talking to by their mentor. And eventually comes back to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Bonus points for the mentor figure in Kamen Rider being Akiji Kobayashi, who played the captain of the Science Patrol in the original Ultraman series, and shows up in some form in all of the early entries of the Ultra series, including a few times in Return of Ultraman. If you haven't noticed by now, Kamen Rider underwent a major tonal shift. This phase is notably lighter than what preceded it. Moments of darkness and tension can still be found, there's just less of it. On the other hand, there have been improvements in the fight choreography and production values are higher. And not even the opening was left untouched. Did you notice? Let's Go Rider Kick is now sung by Masato Shimon. he will retain this position for the rest of the show. But despite the extensive overhaul, all in all, Kamen Rider retains his charm and value as compelling entertainment. <laughs> 
For those who might be new here, or haven't properly watched any of this yet, I recommend giving the show an episode or two. I know how it might look to newcomers, or even Tokusatsu veterans more accustomed to modern offerings. However, it's worth an honest shot. If for nothing else, it's historical value and to better understand the enormous influence it had on a lot of media in the years since. For me, it's some of the most fun I've had with Tokusatsu, and in these socially and politically troubled times, an unambiguous symbol of hope, justice, and righteousness like Kamen Rider means a lot. Anyway, there is still plenty to come. New music, new trials and tribulations, and next time, the return of a familiar face. But what are your thoughts? What do you think of Hayato as the main character? What's your favorite Shocker Cyborg during this phase of the show? Who's your favorite new character? What's your favorite episode or fight scene so far? And why? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Would love to see them. And as always, thanks for dropping in, and hopefully we'll see you again next time.